talk to you more about some of the um, uh, some of these uh, sensors with an emphasis on low resource settings uh, uh, so that uh, they can work um, in uh, remote locations, point of care offices, and bring some of the uh, advanced measurement tools, biomedical tools that we normally have in hospitals or advanced labs to uh, resource poor settings. And one of the greatest vehicles for doing this is actually the mobile phone or other consumer devices. And that's why it's, I think, quite exciting to look at the phone again, the smartphone again, in terms of what it can do for biomedical measurements in general. It has implications for mobile health, telemedicine, um, but at the same time, it has implications for, in general, the measurement science as a bigger entity and education as well. Those I will leave it for a separate discussion and try to focus here only on uh, mobile health and telemedicine related applications. Before I do so, I'd like to uh, uh, highlight some interesting features about the smartphone itself, especially the optics of the phone, to highlight some unique features, some opportunities that we have around the optics of the phone. And what you see here is actually a comparison of the megapixel count of our mobile phones and how it's been doubling every two years matching the Moore's law. So the exponential trend that we see in computer industry and in transistor counts of our CPUs is exactly happening uh, in our smartphone cameras. And what you can see here is an exponential growth, doubling of our megapixel count every two years, now reaching more than 40 megapixels in some of our smartphones. That is very exciting because some of these higher end smartphones with excellent optics can be utilized as very advanced optical biosensors, microscopes, to the level where it can, in, in, in fact, you can convert the phone into a, a microscope that can see individual viruses that are labeled by fluorophores, or even a single DNA molecule can be actually imaged on a phone with a very inexpensive and lightweight interface and sized for bringing genetic testing to your phone. These are all possibilities, and I'll share with you some of these results. In addition to this, obviously the phone itself can capture high-end data, but it can also process it. it. It has the supercomputer capabilities as we define it uh, from the first generation of supercomputers by IBM. It's by far better than uh, the first generation of supercomputers. And obviously this gives us a unique infrastructure, which only is there because of economies of scale. We have more than 7 billion cell phone subscribers, and that's the reason why those smartphones are not the price of a car, high-end car, but just a few hundred dollars. Uh, that's economies of scale. And, and fortunately, most of these smartphones are being used in actually developing parts of the world. Uh, around almost 80% now of, of the phones being used in, in resource pool settings. It's a great infrastructure that you can actually leverage to bring advanced biomedical sensing and imaging to wherever these devices are being used. This is a theme in our lab, and we're working on new technologies that leverage this existing infrastructure for high-end uh, biomedical um, imaging and sensing. What you see on this slide are some of these uh, devices that are most often 3D printed to convert uh, the phone itself with an attachment, with an optomechanical attachment into a microscope, into a sensor. For example, it's not, as I've mentioned in the introduction, it's our a routine for us to convert the phone into a high-end bright field microscope or fluorescence microscope. Uh, sometimes we take the imager off the phone, the CMOS imager off the phone and create these standalone devices that, um, I hope you see my mouse, do you? No, you don't. Oh, okay, so, um, great. So I was pointing <laughs> with, so, Sometimes we take um, these uh, CMOS imagers off the phone and create these standalone devices that, um, that also uh, create some unique interfaces for a microscopy. For example, this one over here, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more in detail. It's actually a, a unique microscope that utilizes only computation and the CMOS imager of a mobile phone to bring you a billion useful pixels, a gigapixel microscopic image with diffraction limit resolution. Very useful for pathology, telepathology applications where you have 
let's say, the facility to, to take uh, samples and prepare them and label them, but you don't have the pathologist, oftentimes is the case. And that those kinds of settings, you can have these kinds of microscopes help you to connect uh, remote pathologists to actually the uh, uh, point of care office or uh, a nurse office. In addition to microscopy, you can do various other types of sensing. Um, this is not just a comprehensive list, but it's just a, a few of these uh, highlights. For example, this is a flow cytometer. It can look at the count of cells in both the fluids, uh, uh, label free or label based, fluorophore based. This is another one. It's an Android application with a smart uh, attachment at the back. It measures urinary albumin concentration in, in urine samples with a, a few parts per million level of sensitivity. In the next slide, I'm sharing with you some other examples of what you can do with, um, with smartphones. This is actually a microscope, but tailored for blood analysis. It can do red blood cell uh, counts, density measurements, white blood cell density measurements in whole blood, and hemoglobin density measurements within less than 30 minutes, including sample preparation and labeling. And it also uses the phone itself as an image processor. It captures these images and processes them using, uh, in this case, is an older generation Samsung Galaxy 2, uh, and reports the results on the phone uh, for quick triage of, of, of blood analysis related tests and, and diagnostics. Uh, this one is another uh, recent work which is looking into um, uh, co contamination of water samples from uh, heavy metals. In this case, it's a mercury detector. Uh, it detects the presence of mercury in, in drinking water with a few parts per billion nanograms per mil level of sensitivity using a very inexpensive nanoparticle based assay. It looks for color change <laughs> in response to mercury. Uh, and per test, even at low volumes, it's only a few cents, less than four cents per test. You can also use uh, the mobile phone as a bacteria or a pathogen sensor. I'll sh share some of our recent results on this later on. This is a very early generation. You don't even uh, refer to this as a smartphone anymore. But uh, back in 2010 or 2009, we used a sensor, uh, 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 the sensor of the cell phone and some you know, immunochemistry here with, uh, with a smart optics to look for uh, E. coli. Um, and uh, achieve sub-CFU per mil level of sensitivity. Uh, some of this work has also been commercialized. This is also my conflict of interest this disclosure. Uh, I am the co-founder of a startup company um, that's based in LA, very close to UCLA, that's commercializing some of these technologies. In fact, this one over here is already a product. It doesn't look like this. This is our prototype back in 2009, but this is now in its third generation. It's a lateral flow test reader. It's, it's not aiming to create new tests, but it aims to provide a universal reader for various different tests, whether they're working on chemiluminescence, fluorescence, or colorimetric readout. Uh, in a multiplex way, it's essentially capturing images and doing image processing to understand the test validity and all the uh, calibrated measurements and reporting into electronic health record systems. This is already uh, CE mark approved and can be used outside of the United States uh, in combination with CE mark approved tests for uh, clinical uh, diagnostics. In the US, it's going through FDA with different tests as we speak of now. So these are some examples. Um, mobile phones are very exciting, very sensitive, uh, very high resolution for what we want to do. In addition to mobile phones, there are other types of interfaces like variable computers that we really like. In fact, we were one of the first groups to create an application for Google Glass. It may not be a great product. I see no one of you using it. <laughs> that must be a reason for that. But it's still professionally very interesting because it's hands-free and voice activated. So it has a unique charm, especially for emergency medicine. Imagine that you need to uh, uh, deal with an emergency situation where your hands are very important to you and you don't want to contaminate your phone or, or any other peripheral. You can actually uh, use the camera interface here to read sensors uh, without uh, you, you know, uh, obscuring your uh, line of vision with just uh, uh, a voice comment. So that's essentially uh, uh, the, the charm of this. Of course, it's less sensitive than the camera interface of a mobile phone because it uses ambient light conditions, whereas all of these interfaces has a 3D printed enclosure. It has its own dark background and its own sun, whereas this has to work with uh, the ambient light conditions, which, which obviously is a problem if, if you're working in, in night. 
Regardless, you can actually read diagnostic tests and quantify them using the camera application where the computation here is done off a server. Gloss in its first generation at least doesn't have the computational power that you have in our smartphones. Recently, we've also created another application which is looking at chlorophyll content just as another measurement of plant health this time uh, through um, a unit that um, transmits light in a non-destructive fashion through the leaf in different bands and uh, a captured uh, uh, image of the uh, gloss is sent to a server for quantification of the chlorophyll content, which is very interesting in the, in the sense that you calibrate it based on a few different types of trees and it's magically working across a much larger panel of trees that you haven't calibrated for. These are exciting, not just because they're compact, cost-effective, lightweight, and they're accurate matching with a few percent gold standard measurement tools, but there is also another element and that is these are giving you measurements that are tagged with space and time. This is extremely valuable because most of our currently existing benched up instruments, they're digital, but they're not connected to a network. There are certain restrictions for, for essentially connecting all these measurements that we globally have every day. Whereas these kinds of devices, uh, of course, with some security at the background, has this exciting feature that it can lead, they can lead to big data and all the uh, epidemiologic studies that can come with that through uh, um, machine learning and smart analysis. This is something that I'll highlight if I have time later on. Now I'd like to spend quickly uh, a few minutes to talk to you about some of these devices. They're not just miniaturized, they have some unique physics and engineering behind them. And I'll start with microscopy. Some of these devices that you see here that convert the phone into a microscope as, as shown here, or standalone devices that take the CMOS imager and create a, a microscope out of it, a portable microscope out of it. These are actually working based on some unique physics that is, they don't use any lenses between the sample and the sensor, there's no optics, it's optics free and everything is complemented by computation. So these are, that's why very compact. This one, for example, is less than 50 grams. This microscope that you see here is, is less than a, 150 grams, they're extremely compact and cost effective thanks to lens-free or optics-free operation, everything else being uh, complemented through computation. In fact, if you look what's inside, these are shadow images. They image the shadow of specimen and reconstruct uh, images of the samples through these shadows. So if you, for example, take one of these CMOS images or CCDs, this is, let's say, the silicon chip out of any digital camera. You can open up your webcam or cell phone, you will find something like this. Roughly speaking, always half a centimeter by half a centimeter if it's a CMOS imager. If you place your sample very close to it and shine light through a very inexpensive light emitting diode, a few cents, and this gap between the sample, it can be a cell or a tissue, whatever you want to see in transmission, uh, and if this gap between the sample and the sensor is very close, very small, sub-millimeter, almost you can push it against the sensor, you start to get diffraction patterns of the samples. These diffraction patterns are shadows, but they're special shadows. If you look at, for example, particles and cells, every different cell type or particle type will cast a different shadow. That's like a cytometer. You can use this as a cytometer to count cells. This is actually whole blood. Most of these things are red blood cells. You can count the density of red blood cells based on these shadows. Sometimes you would see a different shadow type that's actually a white blood cell. But that's not it. In fact, these shadows contain the 3D information about the sample and they can be processed using Fourier optics algorithms to take images that look dummy to you like this and process them rapidly in millisecond time frames to create what you normally get with a microscope, matching exactly traditional batch of microscope, except this is computationally done with just a CMOS imager, nothing but a very inexpensive silicon chip, and the sample against it. This can get very advanced with different types of algorithms. You can take tissue samples, take their shadows, it looks like garbage to your eye, but you can quickly process them and retain the subcellular features of the tissue sample. This is actually breast cancer tissue that is imaged based on its shadow. From these kinds of images, you can quickly go to uh, the real features of interest for pathologists. All of this can be done in a field portable way. This is actually, as I said, less than 150 grams. The CMOS goes in here. This is where you load your sample. And these are the LEDs. There are more than one LEDs here. That's because this works based on a, a framework that is called a pixel super resolution. 
that's mathematically equivalent to saying you give here a five megapixel imager or a 10 megapixel imager, something that one of your mobile phones has. Then we create computationally a billion pixels out of it by dividing each pixel into 10 by 10. So each pixel digitally serves as 100 pixels. And that gives you from a 10 megapixel to a billion pixel um, imaging system, diffraction limited. Um, and that's the reason why we have some of these LEDs. Um, you can use this in low resource settings for looking at blood smears. One of the greatest applications for this kind of uh, uh, technology is actually telepathology. And in fact, you're looking at here thin blood smears, and these are red blood cells that are infected with malaria parasites. This is how it looks with a traditional light microscope, and this is how it looks with um, the phase channel of these computational coherent microscopes. And one major advantage of, of this technology is field of view. It has a large field of view because these are unit magnification microscopes, which means the entire active area of your sensor is your field of view. A traditional microscope with a similar resolution would be able to look at this kind of a field of view and you will have to scan several hundred times to match large uh, areas of sample. But because uh, you directly place it on, um, on the sensor, which typically has 20 to 30 millimeters square active area, you get a very large area. And in the zoom in images, you can see how it compares nicely against a traditional microscope. In fact, we've done blind studies by giving these images to board certified pathologists to confirm our diagnostic accuracy, um, uh, matched 99% to a traditional light microscope. There are various different ways of bringing color information to this uh, modality. This is uh, at the background, it's working based on holography. That's why it's single color, but by switching the different colors, and doing some transformation to actually create for different stains colorful microscopic constructions. Uh, this is another great example. It's PEP smear, Papa Nicolaou smear, used for early screening of cervical cancer. This is actually one of the uh, 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 thin smears prepared. Um, it's monolayer of cells, and uh, under a microscope, a, a pathologist would be looking at the morphology of these cells. The good thing is that with the lensless computational microscope, you can have a much larger area than a traditional light microscope and get um, a digital image that you can actually transmit and have another uh, pathologist that you don't have locally, let's say, uh, look at it and give you the diagnostic results. And one, one additional nice thing about this framework is it's 3D, which means once you capture these images, you can computationally back propagate uh, uh, within the sample plane volume to different planes. That gives you the physical depth of field knob of a microscope, which is great because then a histopathologist looking at these images a few hundred kilometers away can actually digitally play and zoom into different parts of your sample as they normally do with the physical microscope in front of them, which is a very important feature because most specimens, they're not flat. You will have to, as you change the field of view, you will have to zoom in and zoom out again. All of this is becoming feasible in a very competitive form factor, performance, resolution, and speed, thanks to digital technology and thanks to this curve. When we first started back uh, maybe 10 years ago, we would barely see a red blood cell. But now we can, uh, we can go to virus level information and, and use this actually with the diffraction limit resolution in, in uh, high index material with high numerical apertures. Um, in the next few slides, I'll, I'll share with you some of the other work that we've done on a different modality. All of the results that I've shown so far were bright field. They were label free, looking at endogenous contrast mechanisms of tissue samples or, or blood samples. But you can actually also label them and, and create fluorescence microscopes. And I'll share with you some of the recent work that we've done uh, using some of these higher end smartphones for microscopy and sensing. This is actually a dark field and fluorescence microscope that's using a 3D um, attachment to convert the phone into a high-end uh, microscope. Uh, it has a very oblique illumination angle that essentially helps us to create a beautiful dark field uh, uh, imaging system to the level where we can actually see individual viruses. What you see on the cell phone image is fluorescent labeled human cytomegaviruses that are about 150 nanometers in width. And they, they contain each one of these dots, maybe contains um, through the capsid protein labeling, maybe a few hundred fluorophores. 
In fact, using the phone, you can almost reach single fluorophore sensitivity. We're almost there. We can now almost see a single fluorophore using some other tricks that are not highlighted here. But in this case, it's immunochemistry labeling and it's uh, a few hundred fluorophores per virus giving us a beautiful signature. This image is captured in this building using a very high-end microscope at CNSI. It's a confocal photon counting microscope to just show you that we are indeed imaging single viruses. It can be used for viral load measurement. This kind of a technology can, at the point of care, help us for looking at monitoring of uh, patients with, with, for example, HIV or other chronic conditions for looking at the, uh, the viral load of the patient and measuring it. Uh, and in a recent work, we've actually created uh, the same kind of an imaging dark field and fluorescence microscope for looking at DNA. In this case, uh, if you just take a, 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 a spatial uh, substrate which has surface chemistry on it and, and take a, a droplet of liquid that contains DNA of target uh, and gently slide it, you actually um, linearize these um, uh, double-stranded DNA molecules. And uh, you can, um, after some uh, labeling, which is essentially um, maybe five to 10 fluorophores entering between two base pairs, you can actually start to see single, um, single DNA molecules and size them with about a sizing accuracy of one kilo base pair, which means now we can have a framework to look at um, how the copy number variation of genes change in, in, the, in the genome uh, using a very simple uh, fluorescence labeling. Uh, and you can actually, uh, based on this, even look for drug resistance because for certain diseases, a certain gene of the parasite is replicating itself to gain uh, advantage against uh, antibiotics. This is certainly the case for malaria, for example, which means you can take some of these devices and start to look for copy number variations in the parasite genome to, to change the drug that you would like to give to the patient unless, um, uh, before it's late. So uh, this is another uh, uh, interface which is utilizing the phone as a, a high-end fluorescence microscope, but at the same time as a platform for automated uh, uh, an image analysis. So this is very exciting because creating a beautiful fluorescence image is, is important, but you still have to have a microbiologist oftentimes to look at what you've imaged for making a diagnosis or for making a decision. In this case, we're benefiting from connectivity of the phone and machine learning algorithms to kind of get around the need for a microbiologist so that you can do some of these decisions based on just, just the server, uh, server in. This is actually a fluorescence microscope specifically for looking at uh, waterborne uh, parasites in drinking, uh, in drinking water. And, and in this case, we're targeting Giardia, Giardia cysts. These are, uh, um, after E. coli, one of the most frequent causes of waterborne diseases in the U.S. because Giardia cysts are very resistant. In cold weather outside, they can actually survive a few months easily because of the thick walls of the cyst. And chlorine cannot always kill them. So it's a major problem, and most of the campers in the United States are infected, in fact, by Giardia and crypto uh, cysts. So this is actually a, a device built for that. It has a pre-sample uh, pre, um, pre preparation interface, which has a mechanical filter that has pores in it. You can uh, uh, flush liquid there, a few tens of milliliters of the water if you want to uh, sample. And whatever is larger, like a GRD assist size range, is stuck there on that membrane. And of course, there's secondary labeling based on anti-GRDA antibodies, which essentially decorates the GRDA with some fluorophores. And then we capture an image uh, using uh, the cell phone, and that image looks like this. This is actually the membrane, and if you zoom in, you'd be seeing the captured and labeled GRD assists. This is great. You can send this to a microbiologist, and they would really count them and tell you, yes, indeed, you shouldn't drink this water. There are GRD assists there. But because the shape here looks peculiarly interesting, it actually, it's actually like a rugby ball. It's elongated. So you can learn its signature based on some spatial features of our microscope and actually capture these images, send it to a server, and get the counts back. Uh, and that's actually what we've done in this work to show that you can achieve about a, a, a cyst per mil level of sensitivity using a, a platform like this um, um, with, within less than uh, about an hour, which now nowadays it's about less than 30 minutes because we've set, uh, simplified the sample preparation drastically to cut down the time by a factor of two.
So, um, and we've done some other work on, on bringing new types of sensing modalities to the phone. Uh, uh, Vivek in his talk mentioned ELISA, enzyme lick immunosorbent assay. It's, it's essentially a, a technology which uses enzymatic reactions to take the presence of an analyte and report it in the forms of an amplified fluorescent or colorimetric signal. And this is usually done in a clinical setting by 96 well plates. Uh, these are 96 individual wells, and each one of them is actually a single test. Beautiful for high throughput tech, a standardized testing. We created read it for it. This is actually a, a mobile phone shown here, mobile phone reader where we read all these 96 wells by 96 inexpensive fiber optic plates, converting the transmission signature in colorimetric ELISA test in each well into a very narrow um, a cone of fibers imaged by the mobile phone and processed using a server. This large image here is what the 96 fault plate looks like. That's why using a traditional uh, uh, system that is FDA approved and that most uh, of our hospitals use, you need to have a scanning optical system to image such a large plate. The scale bar here is a centimeter. That's why you, you typically look at a printer sized device to quantify these uh, well plates uh, all at the same time by a scanning system. In our uh, system, because of this uh, uh, unique geometry here, there's no scanning. It's very lightweight, very inexpensive to get the entire information in the form of 96 wells and processing of these images. In fact, we pushed this uh, side by side uh, uh, into a comparison with an FDA approved reader at UCLA Clinical Microbiology Lab with more than 1,100 patient data and shown that this device is actually extremely accurate, about 99% accurate uh, compared to a FDA approved uh, uh, reader for various different tests. And we've shown um, for HSV uh, uh, and measles and mumps tests, these are immunochem immunochemistry tests uh, for, uh, um, uh, for uh, essentially assessing the immunity of the patient for, the, for these uh, diseases. And we've shown that you can have very good specificity and sensitivity compared to essentially uh, the gold standard, which is the FDA approved test. These are gi giving you some great examples of what kinds of measurements you can perform sensitively, specifically, and accurately compared to a gold standard test while making them compact, cost-effective, lightweight, benefiting from all the technologies around smart uh, phones and consumer devices. So in the remainder of the next few minutes, I like to um, um, tell you some of the challenges that we, we see ahead of us. There are many challenges in terms of commercialization, in terms of standardization of mobile phones and how they can you know, turn into a product, which I would be happy to talk to you, uh, uh, you know, in the break about many of these challenges. There is a, there, there's a great opportunity, but like any other important significant opportunity, it comes with a significant set of challenges. But I'd like to highlight here one, and that is um, these kinds of interfaces, smart sensors, smart microscopes, gigapixel, billion pixels here and there, are we lost in sensory information pixels and data, or is this really useful? And what are some of the uh, problems that uh, we face ahead of us? One thing that, that, that we see, and many of you I'm sure um, uh, um, uh, have similar uh, experiences is, um, digital technologies, sensing uh, 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 platforms, imaging platforms, diagnostic platforms, they're really improving their throughput, uh, their cost effectiveness uh, exponentially. So new uh, images or new uh, tests to be diagnosed, to be used for diagnosis, this red box here is exponentially increasing from different modalities coming together and spitting out lots of data. The problem that we see is Diagnosticians, unfortunately, humans are not. They're not following any kind of a Moore's law. And, and they won't for a long time. So there is a big bottleneck here. The bottleneck is, are we lost in data? Who is going to look at that billion pixel image? Is this a service to the diagnostician or are we really piling them under pixels? So this is our vision. You need to have some smart statistical learning in between to protect the diagnostician with the most relevant and useful information. This is specifically for images, but this is true for any type of sensory data. You need to protect that stream of uh, images uh, or, or information. Uh, you need to have a buffer between the diagnostician. It might be an MD or a nurse. Even the false alarms 
that we have in IC units in hospitals are amazingly high. So that everybody is ignoring everything. Um, I mean, uh, in a month, more than a million uh, false uh, false alarms are happening in a typical hospital. Um, these are these are uh, requiring some front end statistical learning um, uh, uh, platforms that's going to buffer us humans from this large scale data. How do we do that? You need to have machine learning, you need to have a library build up. But unfortunately, most often this doesn't exist. And building this is a huge challenge. So this is the picture that I have about some of the big challenges that we have with more data. And I'll share with you a, a solution that we did for a very specific case. So I'm not saying this is a generically applicable uh, scenario, but it's something that I, I'd like to share with you as a, a potential solution, solution for some specific problem, which is a subset of this picture, this, this big challenge that we have. And that is, in this case, focusing on diagnosis of malaria based on digital images, microscopy images. And this is actually a, an interface that we created, which you can also play by going to this website, which gives the users images, microscopic images of blood cells to be diagnosed. These are actually exactly the cells that a typical diagnostician would be looking under a microscope to label cells or to say, hey, this, this patient is positive. I see the signatures of mal malaria here. In this case, we wanted to learn from the crowd and try to understand, can the wisdom of the crowd, can a larger group, even though they're not very uh, high end in terms of their training, can they collectively help us to bridge this gap between images and diagn diagnostics? In fact, we created this platform several years ago and gave it as a, um, uh, as a freebie for, for people to play. And uh, th th this is actually, we, we created more than 3 million cell diagnoses so far with um, several thousand gamers all across the world to understand how uh, humans learn um, image recognition, how a human, human uh, image recognition uh, essentially helps us to identify cells, even though they may not be trained on this. In fact, the platform here that we're building is having a smart uh, backhand statistical algorithm there. Every one of these gamers is considered as a repeater in a telecommunication network. Every time you download an image from the web, every single pixel of it comes exactly as it is stored in the local server there. And that's because at the backbone, behind the, uh, between the server and your computer, there are beautiful uh, te telecommunication protocols that enable us to make sure we know the noise in the uh, uh, telecommunication channel and take that into account to make the most probable decision. This is exactly the same thing. Every individual gamer is a repeater of data, and we have so many of them and at the end. For every given image in our database, we're trying to come up with the best decision based on a group of repeaters that repeat the same ground truth with their own noise. And we always give them, the gamers, some images in this interface that we know the labels for. So maybe 5%, 10% of these images are the images that we know. We're tracking you, how good you are um, on a certain day, on a certain hour. Based on that prior error, we're trying to understand the diagnosis of the unknown cells here. So that we uh, estimate these prior errors and come up with the unknown diagnosis for a sequence of images. How competitive can this framework get to diagnosticians without knowing exactly how good they are? In fact, we first took this to undergraduates at the School of Engineering at UCLA. 20, 22 undergraduates collectively came close to about 1% of an expert pathologist at UCLA Clinical Microbiology Lab, So, which, which showed us how competitive, even if you take not experts after some learning, after some feedback, they can get very competitive and just 20 of them roughly uh, can get very close to the gold standard diagnosis. Of course, this is not to claim that this bottleneck can be sold by non-experts. This is just the starting bit of the framework and it's testing. Next, we took it to experts to understand, can we create a better framework for qualified diagnosticians who have their degrees and certifications? Can we, for example, take uh, poorly trained, unreliable diagnosticians of a certain region in the world, 10 of them, and create a digital super pathologist that 
is better than the best of the group. In this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, communication, we, we, we chose the best diagnostics that we could find for malaria diagnosis. These were the best people, professors, who are making a living out of, uh, out of malaria. And we've seen that they first disagree with each other. Uh, the same stream of images are given to these experts, and at the single cell level, they frequently disagree. And the worst is they're not self-consistent. We gave them the same image of the cell three times by slight rotations, 90 degree and 180 degree. They were flipping their decisions. So they're not self-consistent. Everybody can make up for their misdiagnosis if they have enough cells to diagnose at the cost of time and money. So out of this, we've shown that you can take a group, highly competitive group, and create a digital decision by merging the crowd's decision statistically and be the best of the group, which is the red, and this is our diagnosis. So you can essentially think of this as a way to create a competitive consortium of diagnosticians, even if they're individually not very good. Especially interesting because pathologists are hard to find. Well, they're even harder to find in good quality and, and with good, good training and everything. So maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should think of as they are, accept them and try to digitally make up for their lack of training. The other option is training. Now we have out of this experiment created some very unique database. This is the, probably the large, largest database in the world for malaria cells at the single cell level, which could be very useful for making this green training base and this blue box here more competitive, which means it's a feedback loop. As you diagnose better and better with the crowd of professionals, let's say, this gets thicker, better, and this gets better. So this is actually a self-feeding loop to bridge the gap between these larger and larger sets of images versus our uh, same uh, set of diagnosticians. Um, just to encourage you, um, now currently it's actually a training game. You can, if you go log in here, you can take a game. We're not trying to learn from you anymore. We've learned enough. <laughs> and now we're giving our information in the form of training games. Every time you take this quiz, we give you a certain set of images that we know the label's 100%, thanks to the crowd. Then we can actually tell you errors that you've made and give you a score. So there's a scoreboard. Thousands of people have played this, and you can actually place your own score there after playing this game. I challenge you to beat the top scorer, because the top scorer is actually a 12-year-old girl <laughs> from Korea. We took this uh, training and wrapped it as, a, as an outreach program in the summer of 2015 and went to Korea, worked with the Korean government, and reached to more than 1,600 middle school kids. This was a global health education program that they were supposed to take with videos. And at the end, we were giving them our quizzes to understand how they learn. We had a large number of, of players. In fact, out of this, this, these are the 52 different schools that these uh, 1,600 students came from. And out of this, uh, I want to show you the scoreboard. This is 99% coming from a 12-year-old um, uh, girl. Uh, she must be a genius because she hacked our scoring system and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you can see there are other, other names here, and it, it continues. You can go to the leaderboard and, and see all these uh, students. I challenge you now. Uh, one of my colleagues who's running the UCLA clinical microbiology lab, when he takes this quiz here with 500 cells, his score is about 70. <laughs> these are phenomenally competitive scores. And these are coming from most of middle schools because of the large number of players that, that really obsessed, uh, were obsessed <laughs> with this game and played it over two months. So, and if you can beat th these scores before Friday, end of the, end of the uh, program, I think you've uh, achieved your training. And, and <laughs> will definitely let me know. We'll give you a gift from UCLA. I, I do this all the time and I present this work. No one has ever beaten this 12-year-old lady yet. <laughs> so you have a huge challenge in front of you. So thank you very much. <laughs> and, and I'd like to acknowledge all the funders behind this work and, and the students as well. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, 
how much variability do you see in these sort of CMOS integers and how does it impact your results? Do you find that you have to first do a pass to convince yourself that this sensor is a good one before you can trust it? That's a great question. So most of the modern CMOS the cell phones that we have uh, typically use the same kind of technology. Uh, there are very few major foundries, major companies like Sony uh, and Samsung producing CMOS imagers and uh, and most of um, Optina is another great one. Most of them are essentially uh, just a few choices. Uh, and that's why we know exactly what we know. In terms of specs that you should care for, pixel size is important. Uh, external quantum efficiency is important, but thanks to essentially all the competition to get better and better images with your mobile phones, uh, a lot of these things are fairly op optimized. Just to give you an idea, every new sensor that is coming on a, on a new mobile phone, let's say it's new, from, uh, from scratch, a new sensor would cost the company with all the initial bits and later stages about $100 million. So because of the massive volume, they pour in this money to create beautiful, extremely small pixel size and very high sensitivity um, uh, uh, pixels. If you want to get the most out of these CMOS images for these computational microscopy purposes, you better have a better sense of the um, activity of a single pixel and understand, uh, yes, this, the pixel is a square, typically 1.5 micron by 1.5 micron or sometimes 1.1 to 1.1. In all generations, about 2 micron by 2 micron. But the active area is not a square. It's actually uh, not known because nobody releases that information, but there is an active pattern there that the photons are sensitive. Um, that the, uh, the chip is sensitive to. If you know that, you can actually uh, uh, have a better understanding of what kind of a convolution ha is happening there at the pixel level. And that helps you with essentially uh, getting better resolution. But the first thing, just uh, roughly, is the pixel size that you should look. You shouldn't use larger pixel size if you are hungry for special resolution. So you find the manufacturing process, the variability that from that, that no, not, not much. Uh, so defect rate of, of CMOS, obviously these are, you know, every CMOS has a certain defect, right? Some pixels are dead. In fact, this is a great way of understanding who took the picture. Let's say I have a picture and based on the defect analysis, <laughs> I can understand that it's coming from your cell phone because it's like a fingerprint. Every CMOS has certain number of statistical uh, errors in its uniformity. And these uh, uh, would be uh, easy to understand and understand that this picture is taken with this camera. For security applications, it's a huge uh, advantage that we always utilize. For these microscopes, it doesn't matter because holography takes a, a, a certain spatial feature, let's say a cell, let's say a few microns of the cell or, or pa parasite, and distributes that through diffraction to many pixels. In fact, um, holography is a very, um, robust platform for handling defects or non-uniformities because spatial information is distributed. And that's one reasons why early days like 80s for optical storage, holography was much preferred because it will be uh, very robust and read out and write for defects of your paper. The same is true here for CMOS defects. You touched on this uh, a little bit. I was hoping you could elaborate uh, specifically in relation to M Health. Uh, the global health space is kind of unique in that innovations in technology can be disseminated much more rapidly than they can in the US. Could you elaborate on maybe the challenges of uh, going from a, an international setting to something domestically? So um, I think. Dissemination, if you mean uh, running uh, field, field visits and field testing, that's absolutely right. Um, but ultimately, um, if, you, um, if you want wide-scale deployment in a global health setting, you're going to run actually uh, bigger challenges than you, you're going to run in, in the United States. Um, and that's mostly, there is not a clear understanding of who's going to pay some of these interventions in a global health setting. And um, for a destructive technology to be wide scale uh, available to masses, you need to have some productization and, and some for profit end there. Whether that for profit is going to work for, uh, with WHO or other foundations in the short term doesn't you know, change the goal. If you're just uh, subsidized by WHO, you're not a product. 
and you can only survive maybe a few years. You need to uh, convert that into a self-sustainable product that's going to work in the poor infrastructure of, of the developing world and the poor stability. That's, that's I think, something that is still remaining as a major challenge for productization and for longer term self-sustained products. What I see mostly today is early stage great inventions that are having some developed country applications, trying to come up with a cheaper version of the same solutions, trying to uh, target bigger scale operations in, in uh, developing countries, but they always run the same problem. Who's gonna pay? Uh, which governments you should work with? Is that government stable for the next five years? Because I'm gonna be investing a lot of money here with the hope that it's gonna be selling there. Well, not yet. Then what do I do? Then I work with foundations. Great, but again, it's an intermediate solution. It won't last for forever, it can't. And you can't with that foundation money reach the broader scale masses unless uh, a substantial donor uh, comes and says, oh, yeah, this is my mission, I'm gonna pour in there a phenomenal money. Which might happen for certain diseases, but it's not a model that's scalable. And that's, I think, a, a great challenge that everyone has. We're all looking into solutions to that. Uh, and I think it's the local infrastructure that needs to grow. And as it's growing with, with uh, more engineers, more uh, entrepreneurs locally there, ready to absorb and make use of those in, in innovations and work with you, I think that's going to be uh, the ultimate symbiotic relationship that's going to create a longer term impact. Currently, we're focusing on, I think, the transition period, not just myself, but I think as a community. So, can we thank Dr. Oskar